Um, thanks everyone for choosing to be here at the Poetry Center on a lovely Thursday night. My name's Tyler. I work here as the executive director. We're glad you guys are here uh, to hear this poetry reading uh, and to be in this space with us this evening. We're so thankful that this series continues. We're so glad to have all of you here. Uh, without further ado, Larry Evers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, th thank you, Tyler. And uh, thank you uh, on behalf of our project. Uh, the, the Poetry Center has, has been an indispensable partner in putting this uh, enterprise together. <laughs> our other two primary partners have been the Program in American Indian Studies and the uh, Department of English. Uh, I have other people to thank. Uh, we thank them for the labor that they've given us, uh, the goodwill, the energy, uh, and for the cash, <laughs> which, <laughs> which we needed to, to pull this off. Um, look at my list so that I don't forget anybody. Uh, the American Indian uh, Language Development Program, the, yeah, the Institute of the Environment, the Southwest Center, the College of Social and Behavioral Science, uh, and the Confluence Center have all made significant contributions enabling us to do this. This is the fourth and final reading in our series. Uh, prior readers, as you can see on the poster, have been uh, Sherwin Bitsui, Simon J. Ortiz, <coughs> Ophelia Cepeda, and our, our fourth reader tonight will uh, round out the readings in the series. We are fortunate to have been able, as uh, Tyler just announced, to arrange a panel discussion of uh, legal, cultural, historical issues associated with water in American Indian communities, uh, in large part because of the efforts of Robert Hershey from the law school. And uh, the event, as Tyler announced, will be on a Wednesday evening uh, here, April 15th at 7 p.m. Please uh, attend that. We have uh, a poster, as you can see, for the series that was designed by Paul Marocca. I want to thank Paul for designing the poster for us. Paul signed copies of the poster, and we've asked each of the readers to do the same. So if uh, our reader tonight is still able to move after all that we've put her through today, and uh, is able to sign them, you could purchase uh, one of these posters uh, that's signed by the artist and all four of the readers tonight. The cost is $25, and all 100% of, of uh, that money will go to a fund in the American Indian Studies program to support the, uh, the special commencement ceremony that, that the program has. I also need to very quickly uh, but sincerely thank the staff of American Indian Studies for the, for the water that they've carried for us in, in getting us to this point. And that would be uh, Anne-Marie Jones and Anna So. Okay. So now I'm going to turn this over to um, my colleague, Ophelia Cepeda, who will introduce our reader. So it's my pleasure to welcome my friend, uh, Natalie Diaz, and we're very happy that she joined us this afternoon in our, our seminar. And also on behalf of the Autumn Nation, I want to welcome you to uh, Autumn Land, where we have this very beautiful facility and um, a beautiful moon hanging out there uh, this evening. Um, so let me... Uh, do my, my job here, and so we can get to Natalie's work. So uh, I know uh, I initially met Natalie when uh, I heard about the work that she was doing on um, the Mojave language. 
and because that's an, an area language uh, reclamation, language, language maintenance that, of course, I've um, uh, been involved in as part of my work here at the university. So it's very exciting to hear someone working on Fort Mojave. But before I get to that part, um, to, the, to, the Fort, uh, to the Mojave language at Fort Mojave, but before I get to a little more about that, let me just begin by saying that um, in reading around about Natalie, I um, chose some of her uh, writing about herself um, to share with you as part of her introduction. So Natalie writes as coming from the Indian village, also known as Fort Mojave. She lives, lived there with four brothers and four sisters in a two-bedroom house. She is born to a native mother and a Spanish Catholic father. She continues to write, we held to many truths at, all at, all, at once. Each seemed to strengthen the possibility of the other rather than cancel it out. In my house, we never had to choose between the numerous parts of ourselves. We were all those things at the same time, sometimes in noisy collisions, sometimes in an easy weave. So it sounds like a typical family. <laughs> Natalie is also nearby as an enrolled member of the Gila River Indian community near Phoenix. She earned her BA from Old Dominion University where her skill as a basketball player took her on a full scholarship. Natalie played professional basketball in Europe and Asia after her undergraduate career before returning to Old Dominion to earn her MFA. Natalie has had her work appear in numerous places including Poetry Magazine, Narrative, Drunken Boat, The Prairie Schooner, Iowa Review, and Crab, uh, Crab Orchard Review, just to mention a few of them. As a young writer, her book, When My Brother Was an Aztec, has received critical acclaim. Some of her honors as a result of this publication include awards from Nimrod Hardman, Pablo Neruda, Neruda Prize for Poetry, um, the Narrative Poetry Prize, a Lenin Literary Fellowship, a Native Arts Council Foundation Artist Fellowship, and perhaps one of the Probably the frosting on the cake is her recent um, fellowship um, given out by uh, Princeton University, which is the Theodore H. Holmes 51 and Bernice Holmes National Prize, which is awarded by Princeton University's uh, program in creative writing. So that's uh, a wonderful honor. In addition to her poetry, Natalie, as I mentioned, is also involved in language reclamation efforts for the Mojave language. In her PBS interview, Natalie speaks about the high school age population and the importance of understanding that being Mojave is something that they always will carry with them no matter where they might travel. Building the self-awareness of who they are is an important part of language reclamation. With the high school age population in mind, Natalie, along with Professor John Reinhardt from the University of Arizona's English Department, have a collaborative project entitled Partnership for Indigenous Knowledge and Digital Literacies funded by the National Science Foundation. This is a project employing new technologies for documenting the language as well as producing digital language material by and with high school students at Fort Mojave. So she's a very busy person, so would you please welcome Natalie Diaz. <laughs> We did that. We did that native thing where we just kind of walk by and hit each other on the, uh, the shoulder. Um, where's Joss? She said she would save this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm good. Iwanja hotan evakidum hakulo imanch miich tanum. It's not that far, actually. It's just six hours. Um, um, yeah, it's good to see everybody here. Um, thank you to the uh, American Indian Studies Program and to um, Ophelia and Larry uh, for having me. Um, Alexis, who carted me around this afternoon, and um, Cybelle, Cybelle is somewhere, and Tyler. Um, the good thing about bringing Tyler all this way is every time I see him, he's a little bit more tan. <laughs> and so, you know, and this one looks like it's going to stick, I think, <laughs> this, uh, this is the coloring you've got here. 
Um, but thank you for putting me up in the studio. I, you know, I've had a really wonderful time. Um, and Susan and John, um, there's John there. It's, you know, we've got the indigenous knowledge part down, so it was good to find somebody who had that, whatever they call digital literacy, um, down pat. But I mean, it's, this has always been a good place to come, and thanks. And I mean, there are really good people here, so at, at home we would say Mat Mawav, you know, it feels like family here. So I'm just going to read in and out of a, a few things, um, and uh, we, we'll see what happens. So the first thing I'm, I'm going to read is I've been working on some prose pieces. Um, which should make people panic. Whenever you hear a, a poet say, I'm working on prose pieces, you're just like, oh, crap. Maybe they don't know when to stop. Maybe they don't, you know, maybe it's awful. Um, but one of the things that I've been writing about recently is um, basketball. And people have been waiting for me to write about basketball. And, and I couldn't. I don't think I had enough time away from it to, to write about it. And, and I wasn't sure how I would come to it. but. Um, it turns out that the way I came to it is through family and through my, my home where I learned to play. Um, this is important if you don't know this song. <laughs> you know ACDC? I'm gonna... I wanted to give you guys some context. So. Um, the Mustangs. In another life, my older brother was a beautiful, muscular boy who could jump from a standing position and grab a missed shot right from the rim, either hitting a waiting outlet or spring back up to drop it into the net. He had thin ankles, long, lean legs with high calf muscles, balled tight like fists, and split like upside-down hearts. Runner's legs, jumper's legs, Indian legs. He also had the upper body of a Mojave man, wide-chested, broad shoulders, arms and hands that hung down near his knees, like slingshots, is what my mother always said, meaning he was a fighter. He played varsity basketball for our small town high school, the Needles Mustangs. They were royal blue and white. A bright blue Mustang was painted on the front of the gymnasium, another inside against the brick wall, and a third in a circle on the wooden middle half court. Mustangs. I have always associated them with basketball. I have always felt them in me, tolling beneath my sternum, drumming in my belly, hooves in my ears, jolts of muscle in my throat. The way my brother must have felt them running his veins in those years, breaking up and down the court. I love my brother best in memories such as this one. I sat in the wooden bleachers of the Needles Mustang Gymnasium with my mother, my father, and all of my brothers and sisters, and watched my brother run out to the warm-up song, Thunderstruck by ACDC. It begins with an unhinged chant-like yell, followed by the strike of the word thunder, and then thunderstruck. The word thunder is growled 15 times, followed by 19 war-cried versions of thunderstruck. Dressed in Mustang blue tearaway warm-up pants and shirts, my brother and his teammates, some of whom were from our reservation, were all glide and finesse. Their high tops barely touched the floor. They circled the court twice before crossing it and moving into a layup drill, while thunderstruck filled the gymnasium. They were all the things they could ever be. They were Mustangs. They were young kings and conquerors. On those nights, they were forgiven for all they would ever do wrong. Thunderstruck played so loudly that I could only see my mother's mouth opening and closing, but could not hear what she hollered to cheer my brother. To that song, they made layup after layup, passed the ball like a planet between them, pulled it back and forth from the floor to their hands like a yo-yo. I was 12 years old, and I realized right there on those bleachers the music, the power music had over the body, the way it commanded the thoughts to quiet and set the mind loose. I saw it in my brother, in those wild boys. I saw it in my mother. I felt it in my chest. And so it surprised me to find, to find my brother again in basketball. Um, and that's you know, that's where I learned to play. And, and 
And I think I was looking for a new subject. I was looking for a way to not write about my brother, to, to, to find something new. And, and I realized you can't run from the stories that are in you, um, that they're going to come to the surface um, no matter what. I'm mostly going to be reading new things, and then I'll, I think I'll try and hit a couple um, poems that we talked about in the class. So, but these are part of um, these are part of my second book. I used to go to a, a crane sanctuary in Kearney, Nebraska, to watch the sandhill cranes migrate, um, and so it was a little bit like a pilgrimage because. You know, I had to drive to Las Vegas to get on the plane, and then we had to fly into Kearney, which is this little, you had to fly in a little tiny plane to Kearney, and, and it seemed like it took forever to get there. And then um, after I did that for three years, one of my elders told me that you can actually just go to Wilcox, Arizona to see that happen. <laughs> so nobody told me that. <laughs> so, you know, I was young, I was looking for something to pilgrimage toward. Um, Cranes, mafiosos, and a Polaroid camera. I had a few days left of my stay at the Crane Sanctuary in Kearney, Nebraska, when my brother called. It was 3.24 a.m. It's me, he said. It's your brother. He had taken apart another Polaroid camera and needed me to explain how to put it back together. His voice was a snare drum, knocking and quick. He was crying. I didn't want to wake the other visitors, and I knew he'd keep calling hour after hour, day after day, lifetime after miserable lifetime, until I answered. I slid out of bed. Just tell me what to do. You know what to do, he pleaded. I should know how to help my brother by now. He and I have had this exact conversation before. If I love him, if I really love him, why haven't I learned to reassemble a Polaroid camera? <laughs> Instead, I told him about the sandhill cranes, the way they dance, moving into and giving way to one another, bowing down, cresting and collapsing their wings, necks and shoulders, silver curls of smoky rhythm. But he didn't believe me. My brother believes the Mafia placed a transmitter deep within his Polaroid camera, but he can't believe in dancing cranes. You think this is a joke, he whispers. These are fucking mafiosos I'm talking about. You're probably next. He hung up on me. When the light went dead, I caught my reflection in the sliding glass door. I was standing in a strange kitchen in front of a sink in my underwear. I have skinny legs and big feet. I resemble a crane. That dawn, I aimed my digital camera at the sky into the last of an island of late rising cranes lifted into the metallic air. I couldn't take my eyes from the barrel of lens, my finger fast trigger against the black skeleton of the camera. I wondered what it would look like cracked open to its upside down mirrors and shiny levers, how many screws there were, how many lantern lit cranes might come unfurling out of that cage. I wondered what I would look like if the darkened chambers of my body were unlocked, what streams of light might escape me and reveal about the things I collect and hide, and is there a difference between aperture and wound? Mostly, I wondered where my brother keeps getting those goddamned Polaroid cameras. I don't know what it is. He's got a thing about Polaroid cameras. Um, I was taught, who was I? I met someone in the, the room earlier. I came without my poems, so I had a moment of freak out. Um, and as I was printing them, someone was talking about animal poems, um, that they were in a, in a class reading animal poems. So I'm going to read a couple animal poems, but maybe I'll read a, maybe I should give a happy poem. Um, I've also been writing a series of love poems. Um, we talked a little bit about this in the class today. It was a really great discussion in the class. The students were quite amazing. Um, you want to take that again? I'll put my chin up. <laughs> Do you have the Mojave app that takes the chin away? That's what you need. That's what you need on that one. I almost got offended when Larry said I was going to be rounding out the the reading because I thought he was talking about my cheeks, but I don't think he was. <laughs> 
But I'm, I'm always struck by, um, by our hands. You know, like if like if we take we take them so for granted. But if you look at your hands, like every good thing that comes to us, it it, it it's initiated by our hands. You know, when you meet somebody, you reach out to touch somebody, you pick something up. You know, but also every bad thing that we do is is in the same way initiated by our hands. You know, like whether it's a trigger or to hit somebody or to push somebody away. And I'm just it, I don't know. I'm always a little bit overwhelmed and overcome by that idea that we carry these things around with us and, and what they're capable of. Um, these hands, if not God's, haven't they moved like rivers, like glory, like light over the seven days of your body? And wasn't that good, them at your hips? Isn't this what God felt when he pressed together the first beloved? Everything, fever, vapor, atmen, pulses, finally a sin worth hurting for, finally a sweet, a you are mine. It is hard not to have faith in this. From the blue-brown clay of night, these two potters crushed and smoothed you into being. Grind, then curve, built your form up. Atlas of bone, fields of muscle, one breast a fig tree, the other a nightingale, both morning and evening. Oh, the beautiful making they do of trigger and carve, suffering and stars. Aren't they too the dark carpenters of your small church? Have they not burned on the altar of your belly, eaten the bread of your thighs, broke you to wine, to eager, to nectarious feast? Haven't they riveted your wrists? Haven't they had you at your knees? And when these hands touched your throat, showed you how to take the apple and the rib, how to slip a thumb into your mouth and taste it all, didn't you sing out their 99 names? Zahir, Aleph, Hands, Times Seven, Sphinx, Leonids, Locomotura, Rubidium, August and September. And when you cried out, oh, Prometheans, didn't they bring fire? These hands, if not God's, then why, when you have come to me, and I have returned you to that from which you came, bright mud, mineral salt, why then do you whisper, oh, my hecatonchire, my sentimani, my hundred-handed one? Now that we got that out of the way, we'll move back into the, back into the misery. Like into some of the dark stuff. <laughs> um, just because I like to play music, I'll read. I'm gonna read a, a triolet from the book. Um, this is called um, downhill triolets, and there are um, there are three separate triolets. I tried to use the same the same broken rhyme scheme um, with them. So we'll see. Sisyphus and my brother. The phone rings. My brother was arrested again. Dad hangs up, gets his old blue Chevy going, and heads to the police station. It's not the first time. It's not even the second. No one is surprised my brother was arrested again. The guy fell on my knife was his one phone call explanation. He stabbed a man five times in the back is the official accusation. My brother is arrested again and again and again. Our dad, our Sisyphus, pushes his old blue heart up to the station. God, Lionel Richie, and my brother. And what I realized was that when I read this, and I'm at a university, people don't know who Lionel Richie is. They say, is that, is he related to Nicole Richie? <laughs> As what they ask me. And I think it's, well now he's on The Voice, so maybe some of you have seen him. But, so here we go again. <laughs> I 
now, but <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I just want to let it play through the whole song and let everybody sit uncomfortably <laughs> and wonder when I'm going to stop playing it. <laughs> ring, ring, ring at 2 a.m. means meth's got my brother in the slammer again. God told him break into grandma's house and Lionel Richie gave him that feeling of dancing on the ceiling. My dad said, at 2 a.m., God and Lionel Richie don't make good friends. Ring, ring, ring at 2 a.m. means meth's got my brother by the balls again. With God in one ear and Lionel in the other, who can win? Not my brother. So he made a meth pipe from the light bulb and smoked himself reeling. Ring, ring, ring at 2 a.m. means my brother's tweaked himself into jail again. It wasn't his fault, not with God guiding his foot through the door and honey-voiced Lionel whispering, hard to keep your feet on the ground with such a smooth-ass ceiling. And I have a little sister who, who um, she got a boob job, or like the breast augmentation is a medical term. And my father, as, as Ophelia said, my father is Catholic and and he, everybody in the family knew but my father. And my mother told my sister, like, you're gonna have to tell him, we're not, it's up to you to tell him. And we knew, we knew what he would say. Like, my, we can do anything, but the ones he's worried, the, the sins he's worried about are blasphemy and vanity. And so we knew he would say, like, vanity, vanity. And, and so my little sister came home and, you know, she was like, maybe dad's not going to notice. And like, no, everyone in the world notices. Um, and so, you know, when she, she finally told him, like, you know, it was when she, she walked into the, my parents' house for breakfast the morning, she came home, and he did this exactly what she thought, and he was like, that's vanity, like, you didn't need to do that, you know, who'd you do that for? And, and she, she, like, just stopped with a very serious face, and she's like, are you serious? Are you kidding me? She goes, Richie just stabbed somebody five times in the back, and you're mad about this. And so that has become our measurement is that no matter what you do, like, Richie stabs someone five times in the back. Like, that wins. Like, you can't beat that almost. Like, six times, maybe, if you really want to. And so, I mean, there was, we talked about humor, too, and there was that moment in my family when my dad looked at my mom and, like, we needed that moment. Like, because I don't think we'd, we'd really even talked about what my brother had done. And so everybody just kind of laughed, and that was the last that it came up. It didn't come up again. And I'm being a typical native and I'm making this, these small trio lays, which are only like this big, last an hour. Um, so I'm gonna read the, uh, the last, the last trio lay that I promised to read, what was it, 30 minutes ago that I said I was gonna read these. Um, and this is, this is kind of an important poem to me because I have a little brother who's a tribal police, policeman. And um, so he, he was able to, I asked him what the codes were you know, and he was able to help me with them. So he feels kind of like it's his poem. Um, and then my father is always joking and he always says um, that his, his kids are the cops and the robbers. So because I have a couple brothers who are tribal policemen and then I have some that are not. Um, <laughs> tribal cops, Geronimo, Jimi Hendrix, and my brother. The tribal cops are in our front yard calling in on a little black radio. I got a 1015 for 267 and 415. The 1015 they got is my brother, a Geronimo wannabe who thinks he's holding out. In his mind, he's playing backup for Jimmy. He is an itching, bopping head full of fire. Mom cried, stop acting so crazy, but he kept banging air drums against the windows and ripped out all the screens. This time, we called the cops, and when they came, we just watched. We have been here before, and we know 267 and 415 will get him 1015. His eyes are escape caves, torch lit by his 267 of choice, crystal methamphetamine. Finally, he's in the back of the cop car, hands in handcuffs, shiny and shaped like infinity. Now that he's 1015, he's kicking at the doors and security screen. A 267 fiend saying, I got desires that burn and make me want 415. 
His tongue is flashing around his mouth like a world's fair Ferris wheel. But he's no Geronimo. Geronimo would find a way out instead of giving in so easily. I'm going to read you a couple more. Um, oh, my phone's still playing the music. <laughs> the music is always playing in me, Hannah. <laughs> you can't stop the music. <laughs> Isn't that a song? <laughs> so I'm going to have a soundtrack for the recording, which is fine. <laughs> Not the typical flute music you would expect, right? <laughs> That'll be a big surprise for the archives. <laughs> uh, yeah. My voice is a little like scratchy or froggy. Um, I I had strep throat a few weeks ago, and so I, you know, I had to take antibiotics and stuff. But then I had a an event in Chicago. Um, where I met your friend, I see you back there, yeah. Um, I, and uh, I had a reading there at the Poetry Foundation, and you know, I was coughing, so I felt bad, and I wanted to like, have a disclaimer that said you know, I, that I had been sick, and, and then I wanted people to know like, I wasn't contagious, so I wanted to say that, and, and then I couldn't resist, so I said I wasn't contagious, and then I said, well, I might be, and, and then I, I said, that actually the reason why I had come was to, to give back smallpox to them. <laughs> and it was like a Poetry Foundation audience, and they were just like... <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna read another basketball one. So I'll read, I'll read this and then uh, a small prose piece and then I'll read a, a poem and then if you guys have any questions, um, I'm open for questions. But like not about if you have any land coming to you, you know. <laughs> um, my friends are there going to get me a t-shirt that said, um, um, I'm not Navajo and you're not Cherokee. Because every time I go to a reading, people will just say that I'm Navajo and then they tell me that all the, the types of native they are and that they have land somewhere. Did I, do I know where it is? And can I help them find it? <laughs> See, that makes everybody uncomfortable, doesn't it? People are just like, mm. no one will look at each other right now. Nobody. <laughs> now you know how we felt for like 400 years. <laughs> Run and gun. I learned to play ball on the res, on outdoor courts where the sky was our ceiling. Only a tribal kid's shot has an arc made of sky. We balled in the res park against a tagged backboard with a chain for a net, where I watched a wallopie boy from Peach Springs dunk the ball in a pair of flip-flops and slip on the slick concrete to land on his wrist. His fibula fractured and ripped up through his skin like a tusk which didn't stop him from pumping his unhurt arm into the air, yelling, yeah, Clyde the Glide, motherfuckers, before some adult rushed him off to the emergency room. I ran games in the abandoned schoolyard with an eight-foot fence we had to hop, where I tore so many pairs of shorts on the top spikes, and where when my little brother got snagged trying to climb down, my cousin and I let him hang by the waistband of his underwear for an entire game of 11. And if that cousin hadn't overdosed on heroin a few years later, he might have proved us right and been the first res jump man. I got run by my older brother on our slanted driveway, the same brother I write about now, who taught me that there is nothing easy in our desert, who blocked every shot I ever took against him until I was about 12 years old. By then, his addictions had stolen his game. I learned the game with my brothers and cousins, with my friends and enemies. We had jacked up shoes and mismatched socks. Our knees were scabbed and we licked our lips chapped. We were small, but we learned to play big. Big enough to beat the bigger, older white kids at the rec center on the hill, which to get to, we crossed underneath the I-40 freeway, across the train tracks and through a big, sandy wash. We played bigger and bigger until we began winning. And we won by doing what all Indians before us had done against their bigger, 
wider opponents. We became coyotes and rivers, and we ran faster than their fancy kicks could up and down the court, game after game. We became the weather. We blew by them. We rained buckets. We lit up the gym with our moves. We learned something that was more important than fist, at least at that age. We learned to make guns of our hands, and we pulled the trigger on jumpers all damn day. And when they talked about the way we played, they called it run and gun, and it made them tired before they ever stepped on the court. Just thinking about a pickup game against us made the white boys from the junior high and high school teams go to sleep and while they slept we played like dreams I'll, I'll finish with another basketball one actually um, the top people love to make lists right so top 10 reasons why Indians are good at basketball <laughs> One, the same reason we are good in bed. Two, uh, everyone likes that one. <laughs> At about 11 o'clock tonight, some of you natives in here are going to be re remembering that one, retelling it. You ever hear that one? <laughs> Two, because a long time ago, Creator gave us a choice. You can write like an Indian god, or you can have a jump shot sweeter than a 44-ounce can of commodity grape juice, one or the other. Everyone but Sherman Alexi chose the jump shot. <laughs> Three, we know how to block shots, how to stuff them down your throat, because when you say shoot, we hear Howitzer and Hotchkiss and Springfield Model 1873. Four, when Indian ballers sweat, we emit a perfume of tortillas and pine saw floor cleaner that works like a potion to disorient our opponents and make them forget their plays. <laughs> Five, we grew up knowing that there is no difference between a basketball court and church. Really, the Nazarenes hold church in the tribal gym on Sunday afternoons. The choir belts out in the sweet by and by from the low block. Six, when Walt Whitman wrote the half-breed straps on his light boots to compete in the race, he really meant that all Indian men over age 40 have a pair of vintage Air Jordans in their closets and believe they are still magic enough to make even the largest Kamad bod able to go coast to coast and finish a layup. <laughs> Seven. Indians are not afraid to try sky hooks in real games, even though no Indian has ever made a sky hook. <laughs> no Indian from a federally recognized tribe, anyway. But still, our shamelessness to attempt sky hooks in warm up strikes fear in our <coughs> opponents, thus giving us a mental edge. Eight, on the court is the one place we will never be hungry. That net is an emptiness we can fill up all day long. Nine, we pretend we are playing every game for a Pendleton blanket, and the MVP gets a mash and tuck it Pequot sized per capita check. Because a one from Gila River is tiny. <laughs> right? Uh, this is, everyone's like, yep. <laughs> Gotta marry someone from Foxwoods. 10. Really, though, all Indians are good at basketball because a basketball has never been just a basketball. It has always been a full moon in this terminal darkness, the one tail light in Jimmy Jack tall cans, gray granada, cutting along the back dirt roads on a beer run, the creator's heart that Coyote stole from the funeral pyre, cursing him to walk alone through every coral dusk. It has always been a fat gourd we sing to, the left breast of a Mojave woman, three Budweiser's into Saturday night. It will always be a slick, bright bullet we can sling from the three-point arc with five seconds left on a clock in the year 1492. And as it rips down through the net, our enemies will fall to their wounded knees with torn ACLs. Thank you guys so much for listening. <laughs>
so we're going to have a brief question and answer, right? And by we, I mean you're going to answer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, France. To you. That's, that's okay, my, France. I don't France, so we'll yeah, we're France, good, France. Yeah, France. we're a good combination. Good division of labor. Right? Um, okay, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll come to you. Yeah. <laughs> For real? Yeah. You work here, so I guess we have to do it, right? <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time in Prague. Um, and so this is a poem from Prague. Really? To read another one? But a cough drop in my mouth. Uh, the bell, the type, this title could go, so if you have any suggestions, let me know. <clears throat> the Bells of Prague. I never meant to break, but street lights dressed her gold. The curve and curve of her shoulders, the hum and hive of them, moon glossed pillory of them, nearly felled me to my knees. How can I tell you? the amber of her, the body of honey, I took it in my hands. O oh, city where hands turned holy, her city where my hands went undone, gone to ravel, to silhouette, to moths at the mercy of the pale of her hips, hips that in that early night to light lit up, to shining sweet electricus, to luminous and lamp, where ached to drink I did till drunk, where in her rocked the dark Zygmund, her by then a cathedral tower, one breast rose window, one breast room of alchemists, where from her mouth came tolling the music of yoke and crown, of waist and sway. Wanting her was so close to prayer, I should not. But it was July, and in a city where desire means upstairs, we can break each other open. The single blessing I had to give was mouth, so gave and gave I did. Every night has a woman for temptation, every city has a fable for fruit. Like in the castle gardens, where jackdaws waited glaze-eyed along the walls for a taste of new, of figs unsweet yet, yet barrel bright enough for wonder. Not jackdaw, but not different I, how I destroy myself on even the least of the sweetest things. The salt of her burned not long on my tongue, but like stars. I never meant to break, but love the hymn and bells of her. Even now there are nights I climb the narrow stairway to an apartment at Hradchani Square, where a door opens to a room and the shadowed fig of her mouth, split sweet open, and in me ringing. That was lovish. <laughs> Questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, I had the um, good fortune of reading an essay you wrote about um, the poem, um, It Was the Animals. Oh, you did. And you talked a little bit about some of your drafting for that particular poem. And I just wondered if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the process of writing, how you go from your first draft perhaps to a finished product. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I'll talk about that one. I, I, I mean, it, it changes depending on what I'm writing or, or what's happening in my life. Um, but uh, there's a poem I wrote called It Was the Animals. and. Excuse me. Let's see. <laughs> this is. I guess, to be like, um, but it was. Um, 
what happened was my brother, he came over to my home. And so this is, I pull from my life. I'm not, I'm not one of those people who are just ashamed to, of autobiography. Like everything I would ever write, even if I'm lying, is autobiography. Like it's coming out of my head and I have one head and I have one set of eyes and one life to pull from. And, and, <clears throat> and so my brother came over and he, and this is very different from my first book where I was away writing it. So I had this, this comfort of space to, to write through, but I'm home now. And he brought a, this piece of wood and it was tied up in all of these plastic grocery bags. And he, he brought it and he was holding it like it was like a, it was a baby. You know, he had this duffel bag and it was inside and he brought it and he, you know, he set it down on my coffee, on my coffee, or I mean on, on my, um, my dining table and he you know carefully unzipped it and he pulled out all of these things and it was like layer un, unlayering each you know bag and and he told me that he had the ark like that he thought he had the ark like a piece of the ark and he was completely serious and and you get stuck in in that that reality that where you you have to be able to still love your brother and so you're willing i think sometimes to step out of your own reality and even though you couldn't possibly meet him in his, there, there seems to be this other space we create where we're allowed to meet them so that we can still love them or so that you can still be a human. You can still sit here and say, hey, I'm, I have compassion, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not bad because I, I love him, right? You know? And so he, he, he was really serious about this arc and he was telling me like, he was, he was worried for me. Like he was bringing it to save me, this piece of the arc. And it had, like it had been, um, like routered, so there was like this design on it, and he he thought he was reading it. Like he kept running his hands over it and reading it, and, and I mean I was just I had been writing, so my notebook was there, it was open, and I you know I didn't argue with him. I just you know like in order for him to be my brother, I couldn't argue with him. And as soon as you argue, then you know, and and so with this poem, like this came from a real life experience. It, it was a painful experience and, and who's, you know, your brother brings over the ark. It's like, wow, you know, and, and so I wrote this, I just wrote verbatim what he said. Like as soon as he left my house, I wrote down exactly what our conversation was. Like, and it was so, it was so surreal that it, it was like, it was there floating in my head. So I didn't, like I remembered exactly what he said, every single thing. And so I just, I wrote that down and then I just wrote like a quick sketch of it. And I didn't really know what to do with it. It was about two and a half pages long. I don't think it's in, the, it's not in this notebook, but it's like, like two and a half pages long and like it usually looks like this. Like this is what, this is a sketch of, of one thing right now. But it was just like that, that, and then like another half page. And, and I just left it there because it, it just unsettled me. It kind of made me sick a little bit. And, and maybe what's worse than me writing about my brother is that he, he like insisted I take pictures of this. He's like, you've got to take, you've got to see this. You've got to, they're still on my phone. I mean, what are you gonna, I don't know what to do with them. I guess I should have deleted them, but there's that writer part of me. And this is, I, this is what the essay was talking about was that betrayer part of, of me. That's like, hey, I'm gonna, this is my story. I'm gonna tell it. But then you think, well, maybe it's not my story to tell. And I think that's the, that's one of the tough things about being a writer or writing about family or telling stories is, is that. Um, but a lot of the stuff, so, so it was sat in my notebook and then probably like three or four months later I needed a poem for a poetry magazine and I didn't have one and so I was just going back through my notebook and I saw this, these, you know, these pages and I go back through my notebooks and I see what I've sketched out and I just tag them and, and it was strange to see how linear the sketch was that I wrote out because it was based on our conversation and so it was already like naturally narrative and so I took that and I just built the arc around it you know like around that <coughs> painful moment and I let I put all my emotions into image and that's that's what usually my process is I try to find the images that can hold and contain my emotions and all of my work happens in revision like I, it's a rare occasion when I sit down and write a poem, you know, um, I really rely on a notebook and I, I have it like with me everywhere. <laughs> you know, I, I wrote stuff driving up here, which I shouldn't have been doing, you know, so, but I mean, I figure a few less 
cacti on the side of the road. Like, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Ophelia's like, what? <laughs> um, but yeah, like, so that's my process is usually like a quick sketch of something because I often don't have a lot of time. Um, and then I, I rely on my images and then I, I build more images on top. But that's how that poem, I, you know, I actually looked at the pictures again and I could see that my brother had like pipe blisters on his fingers. Like I could see how swollen they were in the, in the pictures. And the pictures are really weird because it's blurred because he wouldn't, he was moving so much. And, you know, and, and he just, he thought it was the ark. You know, and he was so disappointed with me when he left that I didn't, you know. And so I just built these, built the animals of the ark around it, you know. And I'm so glad that that movie, Noah, hadn't come out before. Because that, that bad movie, Noah. They, what, a, what an opportunity they ruined when they made that movie. But, um, yeah, so I'm, I, I'm glad that hadn't come out yet. So I... I, you know, I got to make up my own. Like, what are, what are the animals that I find to be fantastical? And so they were oryxes. And actually, we had just come with John and Susan to the desert museum. And so another page of, in my notebook was about the ocelots. And I had written that their faces were, like, mathematically put together. And so in the poem, <laughs> math, their mathematical faces is what came out. But yeah, so you just... I, I make broken things whole, I think, sometimes in the poems, so. That was a long-winded answer, I'm sorry about that. I think we probably have time for one more. This is such a quick one, so it'd probably be time for one more after this. Um, I don't know the inner workings of a Polaroid camera. Are there light bulbs in it? Uh, there's a flash, so there must be. It, you can see that in that little square. Okay. Right? I mean, you should go home and take one apart. <laughs> Just don't call me to get it back together. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a baby. Well, the baby has a question. You can't leave the baby out. <laughs> family members having read your poetry, especially your brother, if he's ever read your poetry or any family member, and their reactions to it? Yeah, it's just, you was talking about the imagery. Well, we have a joke in my family now, since the book came out, it's like, when my brother was an asshole, we'll say, or, you know, <laughs> when my brother pissed me off. Like, my sisters are pretty funny about that. Um, but... It, you know, it's strange because I, I think that when people see the poems, they think immediately uh, that this is my, my brother, my real-life brother I'm writing about, and, and the eye is exactly Natalie. But they're, they're all masks. Um, even the eye, we talked about this today, the eye, of, of the, the eye in the poems is, it's not me, but it's the way I can get to my emotions. And the brother in here, like obviously my brother is in a Halloween costume. He's not an Aztec. But that's the emotional brother that I know, and so I've built him. And, and why, from the outside, I think it's actually more painful seeming, but from the, like from the inside with my family, like with my sister, my sister was talking about this. Like my mother, when she read this, she said, she was upset, and she said, it's just that none of it happened that way. And then my sister, my little sister immediately said, what do you mean, mom, that's exactly how it happened. And so, I think those those images that they that they are um, they're not real. It's not my real brother. He can be the Aztec. He can be those things that let us feel what we feel for him, without tearing down my real life brother. Um, and so I think the imagery, I think the imagery did a lot of work to hide, to hide me, the speaker, and even to hide my family. You know, like in in the poem, like my my. My mother and father become like a broken Borges and a gouge Saint Lucia, you know, like, um, so that I didn't have to write about my mother and father. I could write about that experience, that emotional experience. Um, but, but it is painful for them. Like, I, there's a poem in the book called No More Cake Here when I imagine a, a funeral party for my brother. Like, if my brother were to die, like, we would have a party. And, and of course, like, I was shocked when I wrote that to find I could go there emotionally, but what I meant was that if if my br like if we did get that phone call, what I was exploring was the idea of finally being able to rest, and the relief we might feel to to never have to worry about him again, 
to never have to wonder if he was okay or to wonder if he hurt my parents. So that's what I was exploring. But I have a little brother who, who saw that, the images in the poem, and, and he hated it. Like, he, he couldn't get over it. He kept saying, like, what do you mean? Do you wish, you wish, you wish Richie was dead? You, like, he couldn't separate it. And so I think sometimes, like, the images let us, they let my family see and feel it in a way that we hadn't because we don't talk about it. And sometimes the images can be more powerful, but then sometimes they let us hide behind them as well. So it, it's been an interesting thing for me, I think, to, to realize even when I'm hiding or when an image actually lets me feel it more. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I don't think I answered that one either. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's he's read it. Like, the, the one of the most awful things is when he, like, carried the book around with him and was, pr like, proud of me. Like, not in his right mind, but proud of me. Like, taking it to people because I had a book. And then to... That was a sickening part. Um, and then, like, he's read poems. Like, he read the poem... Um, uh, the, the, the poem when my brother was an Aztec. Uh, it, when it came out in a journal, he my my father keeps things in the this hutch my mother has, but he took the journal, <clears throat> and he again was like carrying it around. And I, I guess one time when he sobered up a little, he read he must have read it because for a few weeks he called me peacock shit, like he didn't call me Natalie. He didn't even speak to me other than to say like peacock shit, you know. And he'd just be like, and so you know I know he's read it, but I just he's just not. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense to him most of the time, I think. He also says I owe him $6,000 <laughs> because I wrote a book about, about him, he says. so. <laughs> I'm still waiting to make $6,000 out of it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, though, for your question. <laughs> Seems like a good spot. Yeah. We'll end on peacock shit. Thank you for coming. <laughs> and, and my book. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it.